gratitude and with respect, we begin by recognizing the First Nations on whose traditional land we make our spiritual home, the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the Métis. We acknowledge with regret that this history has rarely been respectful. We commit to just relationships in the present. Along with the First Nations everywhere, we recognize Earth as our mother upon whose water, air, air and soil we depend for our lives and well-being. In the midst of a climate crisis, we acknowledge that as a species, we have not acted with respect for our precious planet. We commit to learning and practicing better stewardship. Seeking true community, and we welcome all who have nurtured home and need strength and are seeking deep meaning. Welcome to those who have doubts or do not believe. Welcome to those whose faith is sure and to those who, who believe but are asking large questions. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our hybrid worship service for Parkminster United Church on this second Sunday of Advent. Whether you are worshiping with us here in the sanctuary or via Zoom or Facebook, we are so pleased that you have taken this time to join us and to gather together to be in community. And we hope that this is a time of reflection, restoration, and renewal for the week ahead. At this time, I'm going to turn things over to Joe, who is going to share some announcements Thanks, with Heather. us. So again, just type announcement. If you're online and you have an announcement, just type uh, the word announcement into the chat and we'll make sure to get to you. Just a reminder for those of you that are joining us on Facebook that there is a lag between Zoom and Facebook. So when we ask for prayers and for uh, blessings, um, uh, know that that has already happened. But so get those in earlier on in the service. For those who are joining with us in purpose this morning, uh, in person this morning, uh, we just ask that you remain in your seats throughout uh, the service and to stay seated for your hymns. Um, and if you would like to participate during the service, please feel free to uh, log on to Zoom or to Facebook using your devices and you can interact uh, that way. Again, we'll be hosting our virtual coffee time via Zoom following the service, and you're invited to stay online uh, for that following this morning's uh, service. So Wendy Ridgway, uh, Wendy Watson <laughs> has an announcement. So Wendy, I just invite you to turn on your video uh, at this time and to unmute yourself. There, can you hear me? Yes, could we turn up the volume back there? <clears throat> Try again. Go good ahead. morning. Is that good, Joe? Go ahead, Wendy. Okay. Well, the first thing I need to do this morning is to send it a great big thank you to Linda Bird and her grandson, Jackson, for all the hard work they did putting their Socks for Souls fundraiser together. And thank you to, to our wonderful Parkminster community for responding with over 600 pairs of socks and a great variety of other clothing and bedding as well, all to be distributed to people in shelters and those who are unhoused. So thank you, Linda. Thank you, Jackson. And Jackson has a future in fundraising. I have no doubt about it. My second announcement concerns what has become the annual turkey dinner for Mary's Place, which is now called the YW Emergency Shelter, which reflects in a better way the ongoing job that that shelter does. For the 14th year, the Outreach Committee, with your help, will provide a dinner for the residents. Turkeys are purchased and According to Maria Willenius, the director of the KW Emergency Shelter, the cookies and squares that will come are already being discussed at resident and staff meetings. We will collect the cookies and the squares on Wednesday, December 15th from 2 to 3 p.m. in the Parkminster parking lot. Please use only containers you do not want back. 
Financial don donations can be made through the usual methods and receipts will be given if you designate the money for YW Shelter. More info of all of this is provided in this week's WhatsApp. So thank you again, always for your wonderful responses to those projects we come up with here. And it occurs to me that some residents may be enjoying their turkey dinner with their nice warm socks on. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Wendy. Wendy. Um, um, oh, I, I see Francine, Francine has, has an announcement. So, so Francine, Francine, go, go ahead, ahead and turn, turn on, on your video. video. Go ahead. Oh, oh do you have it? Would it be easier for me to do it, or can you do it? Oh, there she is. Okay. okay. Uh, just a reminder that we are having a Okay, Francine, it's not going to work. Uh, so, sorry. <laughs> so I think what Francine was going to share with us is that next Saturday on December the 11th, once again, the Christian Education Committee is putting on another party. Uh, it's our official Christmas family party happening online once again. And we get a great turnout and we have a lot of fun. Um, families that haven't RSVP'd yet are welcome to do so with me, but we can promise once again there'll be great activities, a very, very special visitor, and uh, some wonderful homemade gifts that have been created for the kids. So let us know if you want to join us, and we'll have festive fun together. Okay. And I'm not seeing any other announcements at this time, so let us continue our time of gathering as we light our second Advent candle. I was asked to speak about what peace means to me. To be honest, it's been hard to find myself in a peaceful enough state to answer this question. Most of us struggle with pain and confusion. It's hard enough to feel peace driving through a parking lot, let alone while hearing the news or dealing with complicated family situations. It's impossible to feel peace while beating yourself up for your own shortcomings. During the 2020 protests, it was common to hear the words, no justice, no peace, meaning that we won't live in a peaceful society until we live in a just society. There's truth to that. I mean, we must work towards a better world. It's also true that if we have to wait for justice to roll down like water before we can know peace, we'll die waiting. But I think there's a different piece, one that is somehow both smaller and bigger. The civil rights leader and theologian Howard Thurman suggested we should see the world with quiet eyes. Seeing the world with quiet eyes means to me, seeing the world and everyone in it, including myself, which is often the hardest part, with compassion. When I'm given the grace to see this way, that feels like peace.
On this second Sunday of Advent, we light again the first candle on our the candle of hope. Today we continue our journey by lighting the second Advent candle, the candle of peace, even as we live with the full awareness that violence is all around us, wars rage, racism proliferates, the planet is exploited, poor nations are left without vaccines, people without homes are bulldozed out of sight. Yet we light this candle of peace, for we recall the words of the prophet Isaiah. A voice cries out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Peace is the path of right relationship. Right relationship begins with repentance. Holy One, who, groan, who is in the groans of vulnerable people and vulnerable creation, calls us back to relationship with you, calls us back to a relationship of humility, trust, and gratitude. As we continue our Advent journey, help us to repent of relationship, of domination, and submission in our lives with each other and with creation. Help us to open our lives to a savior born vulnerable under the yoke of empire in the insecurity of poverty running from the powers of this world. May the light of this candle ever brighten our path and help us to prepare and wait for the fulfillment of your promises. Bless and gift all with hope for a future of peace built on justice for all people and creation itself. In the name of the child, the peaceful one, our journey continues. Amen.
holy God, loving Christ, living spirit. You are present in the everyday occurrences. You are revealed in startling and wondrous encounters. Let the revelation of your mystery unfold again this day through these ancient words that we may see it together. Let the secret of the ages shed new light on our relationship with you and each other. Amen. Hello, my name is Jocelyn Alexander. The reading from our faith tradition this morning is taken from the book of Malachi, chapter three, verses one to four. I am reading from the inclusive translation of the Bible. Well, pay attention. I am sending my messenger to prepare the way for me. The one you seek will suddenly come to the temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you long for will come, says Yahweh omnipotent. But who can endure the day of that coming? Who can stand firm when that one appears? That day will be like a smelter's fire, a launderer's soap. The one will preside as refiner and purifier, purifying the children of Levi, refining them like gold and silver. Then they will once again make offerings to Yahweh in righteousness. Then the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to Yahweh as they were in former days, in years long past. This is the witness of Israel. Thanks be for this testimony of faith.
Well, thank you to our choir and to Neil for yet again some beautiful music to take us into this time of worship and certainly drawing on those wonderful Advent themes. Advent is a good time to remember that the Bible is what one theologian calls a wilderness text, a text born of trauma, displacement, and loss. The ancient writers who penned sacred scripture and the vast majority of the characters that populate its pages were not by and large history's winners. They were the persecuted, the displaced, the enslaved, the desperate. They lived through periods of famine, war, plague, and natural disaster. They suffered starvation, violence, captivity, exile, colonization, and genocide. They were in countless ways the outcasts of the earth. Brave, lonely voices crying out. But what did they cry? Well, they cried their sorrow, of course. In the wilderness, they cried their rage, fear, horror, and pain. But here's the remarkable thing. They also cried their hope. Their ferocious hope in a God who cares, a God who vindicates. Something about the wilderness experience birthed in them the capacity for profoundly life-changing hope. Hope beyond hope. This morning we lit the second candle on our Advent wreath, the candle of peace. This candle now burns brightly next to the first candle, the candle of hope. And week after week, we come together in a spirit of prayer, calling, crying out for peace. Peace in our homes, in our lives, peace in our communities, and peace around the world. We pray for peace around the world, and yet, once again this past week, news reports of violence and war continue. We pray for peace in our country, and yet issues of injustice continue to create turmoil. We pray for peace for the earth, and yet still voices must call out for climate justice. We pray for peace in our community, and yet incidents of racism and systems of white supremacy persist. We pray for peace in our homes, and yet anger and hurt tears some families apart. We pray for peace in our hearts, and yet sometimes the circumstances of life eat away at us bit by bit. But last week, last week, one small glimmer of light gave us hope. And today, the second candle on our Advent wreath burns as brightly as a visible reminder that even in our most painful of moments, God is with us. And God offers a peace for our hearts, a solace like no other. Peace. It is a reality that we pray for week after week. It is a longing deep within our souls. It is a call to us as people of faith, as a community, to work together for. Now, this morning's scripture reading from the Hebrew scriptures comes from the book of Malachi, the very last book in the Old Testament. The book of Malachi, which takes place during the first half of the 5th century BCE, is a brief narrative of a dispute between Yahweh, God, and the people. 
And we come into the story today when Malachi says to the people that Yahweh was going to send a messenger to prepare a way. The author writes, well, pay attention. I am sending my messenger to prepare the way for me. The one you seek will suddenly come to the temple. And this verse is so very consistent with the Advent themes of expectancy and waiting. After all, O come, O come, Emmanuel, God with us, is the call of the Advent season. We are preparing a place, both in the manger and in our lives, for the Christ child to be born again. But let's read on. Who can stand firm when the one appears? That day will be like a smelter's fire, a launderer's soap. The one will preside as refiner and purifier, purifying the children of Levi, refining them like gold and silver. Then they will once again make offerings to Yahweh in righteousness. Now, other biblical translations use the word endure in place of stand firm. And I'm going to be honest, the word endure feels challenging. To endure something doesn't feel very peaceful. To endure means to undergo as a hardship, especially without giving in, or even to suffer. So is the coming of God really something that will make us suffer? Because it's easy to think of Advent as the leisurely, candlelit path to Christmas. It is often presented, and rightfully so, as a time of expectation, preparation, hope, generosity, and gratitude. But there are other more disconcerting forces at work in Advent alongside hope. To use some some challenging language, and I can't believe I'm doing this, Advent is also a season of fire and brimstone. It's a time of judgment, upheaval, and refinement. Refinement. And that image of refining gold and silver is how Malachi analogizes the coming of God. And let's be honest. That process doesn't sound very pleasant. In fact, it sounds extremely loud, painfully hot, potentially dangerous, without a whole lot of room for error. It sounds like a process that might be okay to purify soft metals, but people, the lectionary, is a tricky place to be sometimes. Now, whatever Malachi means, by refinement. It also includes identifying and exposing acts of unfaithfulness. Yahweh's fiery, refining love burns for those who suffer and who are mistreated in this world. For those left out in the cold, the the divine fire provides warmth. For those who break faithfulness with God and neighbor, the fire singes and purifies. In Malachi, Yahweh's judgment attacks human indifference, along with its tempting tendency to view oppressed workers and vulnerable people as just another feature of the created order. Malachi reminds us that the world into which the Messiah comes is at a cosmic breaking point. In Pauline language, creation groans. Human beings' excessive and persistent persistent unfaithfulness to God and to one another threatens to undo the created order. And so for the sake of the world, God sends a messenger to announce announces God's coming. But stay with me here. Because for Malachi, all of this fire and fury is ultimately good news. Because it represents nothing less 
than God's relentless and unchanging love and grace across all generations. Malachi reminds us that Advent is also a truth-telling season. This text paints an image that is true because it does describe the world as it is with all its brutality and pain. But it is also true because it confesses that hope exists within the tragic mess and most especially in the life and ministry of Jesus and promises to come once again to make God's ancient promises into lived reality. Advent is about truth telling, but it is also a season for naming both the pain and the hope. Because let's be honest, pain and hope are a real part of life. And both pain and hope are a real part of peace. His Holiness the Dalai Lama once said, peace does not mean an absence of conflicts. Differences will always be there. Peace means solving these differences through peaceful means, through dialogue, education, knowledge, and through humane ways. Peace is not an easy emotion to feel, an easy feat to achieve, or an easy destination to journey to. Peace is extremely complex. It's easy for us to say with joy, peace be with you. But sometimes it's actually more difficult to live these words out. We live in a world where there is violence, war and unrest. We live in a world where people experience pain both in their bodies and in their lives. We live in a world where differences of opinions escalate and conflicts shatter relationships, homes and communities. We live in a world where people feel sad, alone and helpless. And let it be known that I am not talking ambiguously about the greater world that exists beyond these walls. I'm also talking about our world, our community, our lives. There are some of us right now who are sad, feeling alone or anxious, stressed and uneasy. We so desperately need peace, especially in these times. I think I've told you before that I'm not much of a singer. And so I remember being involved in the choir though when I was in elementary school, and I don't remember all of the songs that we learned, but I do remember, and perhaps you know it, I know the song, Let There Be Peace on Earth. And I can remember singing it with the most gutso and passion. It wasn't pretty, Neil, but I had passion. <laughs> And the song simply yet boldly states, let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. When we sing this song, we cannot sing it with a passive voice. We must act. The Prince of Peace was born into the world to show us the way, but not to travel the journey for us. We must be agents of peace in our lives. We must be the radical face of peace to the people around us. And as we journey together in these times through this season of Advent, being the radical face of peace might push us in new and challenging ways. We must be willing to confront the adversities that individuals are going through and the conflicts that people find themselves in and acknowledge that pain as much as hope is real. We may be forced to have difficult conversations, sit in uncomfortable silences, accept the things we do not understand, and make compromises and sacrifices along the way. We need to be open to the needs of others as well as our own, seek reconciliation and speak out against injustice. But remember this, however along your journey towards peace, 
We cannot read the pain we sometimes find in Scripture without also reading the grace that it provides. See the reality of pain in the world. Don't close your eyes to it. But never let go of the good news and grace of an ever-loving God who calls us to action. The candle of peace burns brightly next to the candle of hope, and I believe that there is hope for peace on earth. Peace is not just a concept or a state of being. Peace is something that we have to actively participate in throughout our lives. We have to prepare for peace. We have to step forward and receive that peace. We have to reciprocate that peace, and we have to sometimes against all odds, advocate and fight for that peace. And so in this coming week, I invite you to reflect on what peace means to you and how you are actively seeking it in your lives and in the world. May this Advent season embolden us as truth tellers, justice seekers, and peacemakers. Thanks be to God. Amen. Holy God, loving Christ, living Spirit, you are present in the everyday occurrences, you are revealed in startling and wondrous encounters. Friends, thank you for your ongoing support of the ministry and mission of the Parkminster United Church and the United Church of Canada through the Mission and Service Fund. Your Your gifts gifts impact impact lives. lives. Parkminster member Liz Liz Ford tells how the Inclusive Ministries Ministries Committee is is doing that that. and just just how that and how important it is that that Parkminster is engaged in this work. Hi, my name is Liz Ford. I have been asked what Parkminster and the Inclusive Ministries Committee means to me. The Inclusive Committee began as a way to ensure that we would keep the promise of accepting the LGBTQ community on the front burner. We made sure that everyone felt welcome here at the church. Things moved slowly at first. However, the year that Joe and Heather arrived, we put the invitation on the church sign for the LGBTQ potluck and welcoming allies and that community, and we said all were welcome. 
The pride flag had been flying at the front of the church for a couple of years, so we were surprised to be facing a hate message painted on the, on the concrete in front of the church door. The police and the media came. Joe and Heather handled the situation with grace. The community rallied and our potluck was packed. About 75 people came, including the police. Since then, our potlucks are over 50 people, mostly from outside the church. Over time, the inclusive expanded its outreach and different groups have begun to meet here at the church. AFWA runs a cooking circle for people who are HIV positive. These people have not been welcome in lots of churches, so they are happy to be here at Parkminster. A group called the Gay Plus Men's Social Network have also found a home here. They needed a space that was welcoming to them. These men often express their gratitude for this safe space. Inclusive does more. Nancy makes sure that we get a newsletter about events that work on truth and reconciliation. Her group has brought the blanket exercise to the church and each month Parkminster helps feed the protesters at 1492 Landback Lane. People at the church volunteer to drive or cook or to make donations to cover the cost of the food. Since COVID has happened, the Inclusive Ministry Committee has been called to change directions and walk a new path. We realized that we needed to look racism right in the eye and we needed to become an anti-racist church. Adrienne created pop-up talks. She and Joe organized blocks, a talk by black scholars who researched how it was to be black in the United Church. We asked council work to work towards becoming an anti-racist church. Council has willingly taken on the task. All of this takes energy and the work is slow. Native helps us have different conversa difficult conversations and we are glad to be challenged. People being welcomed into church is what I think church is all about. At Inclusive, there is a lot of passion for this work. It has always been a most amazing committee and I'm grateful to be able to be part of it. I wish to list the current committee who work hard and who really care about each and every one of you. Thank you to Meta Thradlin, Alan Switzer, Nancy Dykstra, Kevin Smith, Adrian Barrett Hoffman, Jaden Jones, and to Reverends Joe and Heather. You all make Parkminster a welcoming place to be. Let us pray. Holy One, you come in this holy season with the simple gift of life itself. We are invited to share from the abundance of our lives so that others might be filled with hope, with love, and with grace. Bless these gifts so they may be used to share wholeness and welcome for all. Amen. So let's come together now to share the blessings and the concerns um, of uh, our lives, to share the yearnings, the struggles, and the joys. So if you have concerns or blessings that you'd like to share, I would invite you to um, put them in the chat um, on, on Zoom this morning. I do have uh, one concern that was brought to my attention. Uh, Lonnie Kerbel has asked uh, for prayers. Uh, Lonnie's been uh, diagnosed uh, with COVID, and um, she uh, she uh, she is she has stabilized, and she welcomes all our prayers, and she uh, invites people to uh, email and message her, but no phone calls uh, at this moment as she is struggling uh, with her voice uh, right now. Um, we see a thank you to Liz for her. Uh, inspiring message um, this morning. Also, some uh, comments about your reflection this morning, Heather. Right, and there was uh, a thanks well. earlier to to Adrian for her reflection to us on peace. Yes. Um, and and to everybody, as always, who are helping out with the service, whether you're involved within the worship service itself or there's so many behind the scenes. Uh, we just want to say thank you to everyone who gives so much time and effort to this community. We appreciate you, uh, Laura. Um, Ford is sharing that she's in the hospital for the third time uh, this year with an infection that appears to be impacting her kidney transplant and the 
doctors are currently baffled. So prayers for Laura this Absolutely. morning. Absolutely, and Adrian is sharing, please pray for my mom, Sharon, who just had a second surgery uh, for her breast cancer. So we'll certainly keep uh, Adrian's mom as well as Adrian and the family in our prayers at this time. Any other prayers, blessings or concerns to share this morning? Then let us, uh, let's take these joys and these concerns into our time of prayer and reflection. Yeah, the Advent story, the, what's really nice, I think, about the Advent liturgy is that the readings that are normally set up in the lecture cycle start with, as it were, something coming which sounds as though it's going to be violent. And it gets less and less violent. And then it ends in something absolutely unremarkable. <laughs> and that's the remarkable thing about it. It's the undoing of the expectation of... The remarkable is the unremarkable? Yes, exactly. It's a hard sell. <laughs> Christianity is a hard sell in that sense. <laughs> yeah, but it's the. What gives you hope about the unremarkable? Um, because it's the undoing of wrath. The assumption that if God is going to arrive, then it will look wrathful. <laughs> um, and the realization. You know, this was, even John the Baptist expected that. John the Baptist was pretty thrown by Jesus not being as wrathful as he had expected. And the realization that actually there is no wrath at all in God, that wrath is our wrath, and we're pretty good at it. <laughs> and that God is going to start undoing all of that from within, starting from the most vulnerable place that a human can be, which is as a baby. Great love, we give thanks that you refuse to give in to our demands that you come among us in force and dominance dividing us into the righteous and unrighteous, reducing us to pawns and objects, stripping us of our humanity. We give thanks for your coming among us in vulnerable love, in the gentle invitation to join with you in discovering our true selves, in partnering with you in the healing of the world, in joy, in right relationship with all of creation. We give thanks for the vulnerable love that lies within each of us, waiting to be discovered. We give thanks for your presence that invites us in, that waits endlessly, that demands nothing, yet offers everything great love undo our wrath the wrath we hold for ourselves in endless self-judgment comparison and condemnation the wrath we hold for others in ignorance lack of empathy and fear the wrath we hold for creation in our sense of superiority, in our greed, in profaning what is sacred. Prepare us to receive you in the coming Christmas season, an unlikely savior born in meekness and weakness, the child of a peasant girl, 
born in a stable, laid to rest in a feeding trough, forced to flee a refugee. Prepare us, undo our wrath, that we may see you in our midst. We hold fast to this promise and vision of peace as we live in the midst of brokenness and division. We lift our hearts in prayer this week. We hold in the light those struggling with COVID and those working with COVID, especially the peoples of, Southern, of the Southern African nations dealing with the Omicron variant and scientists seeking insight into the implications of this new strain. We hold in prayer our leaders seeking to come to grips with the unprecedented level of international cooperation required to both immunize the world and respond to the climate crisis. On this Sunday, closest to the anniversary of the murder of 14 women at Montreal's Ecole Polytechnique, we lament that gender-based violence is still with us. Holy One, we pray for the undoing of wrath against women, for a world where women do not have to look over their shoulders on the street, a world where equal pay and opportunity are no longer issues, that require advocacy, a world where people of all genders and no gender live in relationships of respect and justice. We pray for relief, strength, courage, and support for the people of BC as they attempt to recover from catastrophic flooding. For all of us struggling with anxiety, despair, loneliness, and fear as rational responses to our times. For those of us for whom Christmas is a difficult time of year because of loss and grief and the triggering of difficult memories. And we take some moments of silence now to offer our thanks and to hold space for our very private prayers of concern. God of the breath and God of the galaxies, undo our fear that we might undo our wrath, that we might see the world with quiet eyes and know the peace of your presence in the innumerable gifts of grace that inhabit and surround us. Amen. Justice 
and searches for the truth. Thus says the prophet to those of Israel, a virgin mother, well, very Emmanuel, one whose name is God with us, a Savior shall be, through whom hope will blossom once more within our hearts. Mountains and valleys will have to be made plain. Open new highways, new highways for our God, who is now coming closer. So come all and see, and open the doorways as wide as wide can be. In lowly stable, the promised one appeared. Yet feel thy presence throughout the earth today, for Christ lives in all Christians and is within us now. Again on arriving, Christ brings us liberty. Go from this time of worship to be people of peace. Invite peace by acting out of compassion and not fear. Invite peace by listening to all sides of the story. Invite peace by praying for our world. And as you do, the presence of God, the quiet center of all life, will be with you in all you do. Go therefore with peace and loving abandon. Amen. Mm -hmm. 